I'm your host, JJ Walsh in Hiroshima, Japan today. And I am talking with activist, nonprofit founder, Kimiko Hirata. Thank you so much for joining, Kimiko. Thank you, Joy, for inviting me today. It's so wonderful to have you on the show. It's been a long time since we had someone who's so passionate about working toward climate justice in Japan. Um, and you recently won an uh, award at the end of last year. Uh, tell me about this Goldman Environmental Award. Yes, uh, this is uh, one of the uh, most famous environmental uh, prize uh, that is given to the grassroots activists uh, every year. Uh, to me, this prize is somewhere very far away. <laughs> for, and I didn't think that I have any chance to receive such a big prize. So I am the one who had a biggest surprise <laughs> to receive this. Uh, but I received it because of the work that I'm working on fighting against coal power development in Japan and overseas. And Goldman uh, recognized my work as an important uh, work uh, from the global perspective. So yeah, this is it. Um, this is a great encouragement to me, myself, and also the uh, colleagues and teams and local people who jointly work uh, on this issue. There are many pictures on it. Uh, so there are pictures. so many. Now, one yeah. of one of the uh, you were doing a kind of a multi. Uh, version approach. You were working with businesses, you were working with government, you were working with activists. Uh, tell us a little bit about the campaigns that you ran in order to get 13 coal factories closed. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, before uh, talking about the what we have done, uh, I'd like to sh uh, tell a little bit about the situation of NGO in Japan. Unlike, you know, civil society activism, activism in Europe or US, uh, the NGO existence is not really uh, recognized uh, by society and uh, activities are not that big and NGO itself is not that big. Uh, so as a result of that uh, impact or influence uh, by NGO are limited. So I'm fully aware of that. So how we could have impact on uh, the uh, activi economic activity that has adverse effect on climate change. So I needed to think very you know strategically and creative creatively um so first of all the coal power expansion uh trend was very obvious right after fukushima nuclear accident because of their uncertainty about nuclear future and also the uh uncertain situation of the electricity supply so I found out that this is a big program uh, because coal power uh, emits a lot of CO2s. So this is a counterproductive activities on uh, the environmental protection. But when I looked around the, you know, the countries, there are no movement to fight against coal power development or, or either people didn't know where and how much coal power will be built. So I started that if there's no voices, uh, the government or, or companies doesn't care and then just build, build it. So we enter the community and talk to people, educate people, and then create some movement locally, that's one. And also we talk to the government and, and then developing developers who build power plants that to raise the concerns, but not only those, you know, uh, creating the movement domestically, because I'm aware that our power is limited, I, you know, ask for help for overseas friends, research researchers or uh, uh, the NGOs or a uh, think tank outside who have 
greater capacity to support us. So I tried several, you know, different pieces to, you know, create mm. the movement, a, a bigger movements in Japan. So each piece of the work connects each other and created momentum. So how, that's how that movement grow, uh, has grown. It's a really big issue, and I think it doesn't have enough people talking about it. Um, now, one of the things I found in your newsletter was that Japan has never had a resolution about the rights of people in terms of environmental justice. And so in 2021, when the United Nations had the Human Rights Council talking about environment and people's mm -hmm. rights being connected, uh, Japan was one of only four countries which abstained from voting. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, that was a, a surprise. Uh, the only four country uh, didn't vote for and Japan included. And the other country who voted uh, um, abstained was uh, I think in Russia uh, or China, those who does have a very bad record on uh, the human rights. So uh, I was, it was very disappointing uh, action by Japan. But Japan, this reveals the facts that Japan doesn't see that climate change is a human rights issue. And then Japan doesn't care that coal power or economic activities have greater impact mm -hmm. on the people and also uh, the uh, younger generation or future generations. And also Japan doesn't care much about the environment and the climate. So yeah, this is the fact that we have to face and recognize. That is really surprising to me because I always have the impression uh, because I worked in tourism for, for many years and I taught university students uh, talking about tourism, talking about Japan's brand, there's a very common image in Japan that there's a deep love of nature and a deep connection to the natural environment. So what you just said it sounds really strange. How does that not sound strange for Japanese people? Well, uh, it's also true that people love nature and people feel connection with nature. That is a beautiful part of Japanese people. And I think it remains uh, in the people's heart. But at the same time, there is also the other part of the Japanese character, which is the, you know, uh, very developed uh, industrial industrial realized uh, economic, you know, um, part of the, the you know, character. And current, uh, the Japanese economy uh, is more um, uh, inclined to develop more uh, uh, economy and also to maintain the, uh, the level of the uh, wealthy, wealthy uh, countries. So um, in order to <clears throat> maintain the level of the high economic uh, uh, activities, Japan invests a lot uh, into the activities that has a bad impact on the environment. When do, uh, when they or people decide developing more um, economy, the part of the, you know, protecting natures uh, will be easily forgotten. So there are uh, in, uh, contradiction uh, in the Japanese people's uh, response to this um, country. Well, we're going to talk more about uh, some of the really exciting and important events that are happening this year, uh, which you introduced from your website in a minute. But before we do that, uh, let's step back and just talk a little bit more about your background, Kimiko. So uh, tell us how you got passionate about the environment. Yeah, um, it's 
back to the long time ago <laughs> when I was uh, the uh, undergraduate student at the university. There was a first uh, movement on a global environment. And until now, um, I didn't think anything about the environment uh, the problem. But I was very, very shocked by knowing the facts that human beings destroy global environment, not only the local level. And I didn't think about that, that living uh, in this world uh, without noticing, you know, um, have, a, have had a negative consequences. So I didn't want to do anything bad on the environment, but uh, living itself uh, has a problem. Uh, so I, that, you know, um, was a quite shocking event. And then I started to think about what is the problem? Why the, the you know, world is heading towards the wrong directions and who is solving this problem? I didn't uh, have an answer right away, but I started to, you know, research, read a book, and then, you know, uh, my interests became greater. So um, it took time for me to make a decision to work on this issue. So I got a job at the publisher um, at first, uh, but I couldn't just ignore the issues and I really wanted to be involved in part of the solution. So that's the start. Um. <laughs> and then you, you were an intern in Washington, D.C., in America? Yeah, uh, after I started the job at the publisher, I still, you know, kept considering what I could do. And then I looked for the opportunities, whether I should be a researcher or whether I should, you know, get into the government or whether I should, you know, um, study again or what else. But there are any other position besides NGO that fits my interest. So probably NGO uh, can be the one who could lead uh, the um, way. Um, but at that time, uh, Japanese NGOs are not that big. Um, it still is, uh, but <laughs> uh, and I have no expertise uh, and I didn't think that I could play an important role if I ju just jumped in. So I decided to go to the, to the United States to learn about how US NGO uh, play and how they manage uh, it themselves and how they have impacts or do the lobbying activities against the government on these issues. Because I knew that there are many, many NGOs in Washington DCs. So I wanted to, you know, learn from them. Uh, so that's the start. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great part of the experience, I think. Uh, of course, Japan's situation is very unique and different, but learning what other groups around the world are doing and then having that network so you can then collaborate on uh, events or campaigns, is that right? Yeah, uh, networking is the one of the most important thing that I uh, think uh, in, in the work, uh, connecting the dots of the uh, people who does have the same you know, objectives and also sharing the you know, experience uh, and, and the good practices and then to gain more and power. I think that is the, most important thing that I, I think in my work. And then you were working with the Kiko organization, is that right? Kiko Network. Yeah. yeah. Can you tell us about Kiko Network and your work there? Yeah, this is the uh, organization in Japan working on climate change uh, established in 1998, right after the Kyoto uh, conference in 1997, UN Kyoto Conference in 1997. Uh, so I joined uh, the, this organization from its start uh, in 1998 uh, and I started my work in Japanese NGO since then. 
So this is the uh, center organization, nationwide organization working on climate change. So my experience is uh, working on uh, advocacy and campaigning and also the work around Kopara uh, development uh, were uh, under the under this organization. Yeah. And then this year you started your own organization, uh, Climate Integrate. Yes. Tell us about, about starting that and uh, what's your mission or what's your focus? Yeah, I, I had been with Kiko Network for 23 years. <laughs> and uh, the work there uh, is very important and it, is, it will still be. So I will closely work with Kiko Network, but um, I thought that uh, we need to create more uh, greater uh, um, power in civil society. So I wanted to create to add up uh, that power. So um, that's one. And also, already nowadays, governments say that we aim carbon neutrality. And so as big corporates as well, they say that climate protection is important and we, 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 you know, uh, we will achieve net zero. So target is set as a country and as, as a whole. So the, pro, the issue is whether we should you know, uh, tackle climate change. It's not like that, but when and how. So I thought that we need to create another network with different people across the sectors between business uh, and civil society and uh, the government. So um, I would like to provide more support to the people or institute or uh, ent any entity who doesn't have a clue what to do or where to start or you know, and how you know and, and how to. Um, so uh, I wanted to take a different uh, approach uh, from Kiko Network to adapt to the um, uh, in in yeah adding up to. Oops. All right, yeah. let's talk about uh, some of the targets for this year. Um, I found it really interesting about what is happening in Japan um, this year in terms of government policy, international kind of uh, standards and how Japan is likely to vote or be a part of it or not. Um, so in one of your newsletters, you're talking about uh, different timelines. So it looks like June is going to be a big month in Japan as well as abroad. Uh, in June, Prime Minister Kishida is going to introduce a clean energy strategy, is that right? Yes. Yeah, that is the Prime Minister-led initiatives. Uh, and then it, it's going to be the first uh, growth strategy as well as climate strategy by current Prime Minister. Yeah, so that that has a, a lot of potential to push uh, some positive change in how the government works. Um, but you also mentioned when you're talking about this timeline that because of the war uh, between Russia and Ukraine right now, that there is kind of a pushback against moving forward with climate policy. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, there are several dimensions that affect climate policy because of the current geopolitical situation. First of all, politically, the, the climate agenda has lower priority because of the security issue is higher. That is yeah, quite understandable because of the, the current situation. But that not only that, uh, the energy security issue for Japan is very serious. So where Japan can get energy from? Uh, Japan reliance on Russia is not that high um, in terms of their oil or gas or uh, 
uh, coal imports, but still certain uh, percentage are uh, shared. And also it increased the cost of the uh, fossil fuels imports. So it affects Japanese economy a lot. So um, we've been advocating to reduce reliance on coal and gas because of the emitting CO2. However, diversification of the energy sources uh, is has been priority for Japanese government, but it's more importantly discussed uh, by the government. We should keep coal, we should keep gas, but at the same time, we need nuclear. That kind of discussion is quite live in Japan. So where the climate protection fits into that deep discussion, that is going to be quite a certain. And also we've just experienced uh, the, um, the risk of the blackouts a few days ago, uh, about a weeks ago, uh, because of the, uh, especially in Tokyo uh, area, uh, because of the uh, earthquake uh, in the in Northern part, uh, mm -hmm. there was a, a the, some of the coal power stops operation, and then we had very cold weather. So uh, we felt that whether we could, you know, uh, <laughs> avoid blackout or not, uh, we managed, uh, but uh, we realized that electricity supply is very important. So those are uh, the uh, created uh, the different perception of the electricity supply and the future security. So there are pushback clearly, uh, but uh, we do have to differentiate what is necessary uh, to protect climate and what uh, on energy choices versus uh, the very short time response to avoid the short time risks. Um, yeah, so it's difficult. And then another point, sorry, to our uh, the carbon pricing, uh, pricing on carbon uh, is the major uh, important uh, policy to discuss, uh, to introduce, uh, that is, uh, that has an effect uh, to increase the cost of the fossil fuels and then incentivize to shift uh, away from fossil fuels. And it is recognized that it's important policy to be introduced and in the strength in order to protect climate. However, government is now subsidizing gasoline to reduce the cost of gasoline. So that effect is totally opposite. So that kind of things uh, could, you know, uh, uh, lead us to forget about climate protection. So there are a lot of things uh, that, are, that we need to uh, go, go through. Yeah, it's a very complicated issue, but there is a lot of uh, progressives and climate activists around the world who are arguing to use this opportunity now to accelerate clean energy solutions instead of stepping back and saying we need to subsidize more fossil fuels let's step forward and subsidize clean energy more i know it's not that simple um especially in such a short time um you know this more than anyone i think uh you had this uh graph on one of your newsletters talking about the 1.5 target and the 2030 um, and 2050 targets, of course, in Japan that they've they've made as their climate uh, carbon neutrality targets, right? Can you talk about this graph a little bit? Yeah, this shows uh, the uh, greenhouse gas emissions in the past and also the future projection. And we hit the highest uh, in 2020 we continue to uh, increase uh, greenhouse gas emissions until now while we are talking about climate change a lot last few decades. So this is a reality, but from now on, we need to reduce emissions dramatically if we want to keep temperature rise at the lower level. By the way, we already, um, the global temperature rose to 1.1 uh, degree compared to the pre-industrial level. So we are in the global 
global warming uh, world already. But in order to keep temperature rise from 1.1 to 1.5, and and the stop in order to stop the warming up to 1.5, we need to reduce emission very sharply from now, stopping the increase first. And especially as this graph shows, very sharp reduction by 2030 is necessary if we want to keep temperature rise to 1.5. So we are talking about 2050 net zero. So it sounds like we have 30 years, but actually our fight against a climate disaster is, uh, our timeline is 2030, I have to say, because we have to have emission by 2030 globally. And we can, if we cannot do this, we are not able to achieve 1.5. And warming beyond 1.5, it's just a disaster. Catastrophic events cannot be avoided. So we cannot say that probably two degrees is okay or not. We have to achieve 1.5. So we do not have time. So we cannot continue burning coal or gas. So how you know the world and the people can face this urgency is the crucial issue for us. Yeah. And you know, this this data is very clear. Uh, and the COP26, the information was very clear. You talk about COP26, uh, one of the significant things coming out of that conference was the rules for market emission trading, joint ventures. It was the first time that it was so clearly stated um, to have fossil fuels, coal, oil, and gas in the final statement. So COP26 was kind of a game changer, is that right? Yeah, I think so. Of course, that result uh, was not sufficient to stop climate change at all. <laughs> but at the same time, it gave very strong political signal to the world. It clearly stated that we need to achieve 1.5, not take two degree, uh, not allowing, allowing uh, the global warming more than 1.5. And it, and in order for that dramatic, you know, a change uh, of using fossil fuel is necessary. And it's the first time as UN, UN Climate uh, Convention's document to mention about uh, stopping fossil fuel subsidy and also reduce coal power. This is too much for UN to mention about it because this is country's decision what to do, but they, you know, uh, go beyond that because that's necessary. So um, that is uh, that gives us hope, even though situation is so tough and it sometimes uh, we we feel that probably it's too late or it's impossible, but government is still trying to tackle and what we need is to just to accelerate it yeah for the our future right yeah now in in japan's response unfortunately japan is still <laughs> investing heavily in coal and fossil fuels uh you talk about a new coal factory plant uh power plant just opened end of last year in Fukushima, and another one is about to open in Kobe. So your main focus, it seems, of a lot of your organization and your campaigning is to reduce coal. Uh, it must be so difficult when you see the continuous investment in coal despite 2030 and 2050 targets, right? Yeah, this is very, very... Um serious and difficult um, situation. Uh, unfortunately, I received the prize as introduced uh, to you know, stop uh, one third of, of plant coal power, but that means that two thirds of coal plant, power plants didn't cancel and started to construction 
and started to operate. So what we see um, <laughs> is increase of the core power capacity, not the reduction. So um, it's so hard to you know, recognize the fact that the government and companies still building new cores, which is um, uh, locked in uh, the CO2 emission for next decades, two decades or so. So uh, it's so uh, tough for us to uh, tackle this and um, it's, it's not easy thing. Um, and the government is still saying that coal power is necessary for Japan. And there is only uh, five or six countries among the over 40 developed countries which doesn't commit to phase out coal from coal. And government still trying to invest new technology on top of coal power for them to reduce CO2. But this is just a prolonged lifetime or coal power, subsidizing coal power <laughs> isn't really the pathway. So um, yeah, we are struggling and we need more help. We need more support. Uh, so um, understanding what's going on is something to start up, uh, start for Japanese people. Many people don't know that coal power is still developing in Japan. Yeah. Now, one of the ways I think uh, your your activities were so effective is talking about the Japanese banks, which are also funding a lot of fossil fuel projects um, and getting awareness out there that people can make a difference by moving their money, by talking to their bank, by talking about companies that are better options. Uh, tell us a little bit about the defunding campaign that you did. Yeah, um, yeah. I wanted to approach, uh, try many different approaches that has uh, that could have impact on this uh, economic act uh, economic activities. So uh, the actions that I took last few years uh, was to target banks which funds, as you said, a lot of uh, money towards um, fossil related projects. So not only to uh, look at the public money by the government, private um, money has causes problem. So uh, we, as organization at Kiko Network, purchased share of one of those banks um, banks and challenge and submit shareholder proposal, asking them to be aligned with, um, asking them to change their uh, business activities to be aligned with uh, the climate goal. So that had an impact, but what, what we wanted to do uh, through this activity was to get top level uh, management to understand that shifting business activities and shifting money towards cleaner uh, uh, direction is necessarily an urgent. Um, and that was a um, big one uh, in terms of the impact that gained a lot of uh, attention because it's a new uh, action. It, it's quite new approach uh, to Japanese uh, um, society. And also, that was also the good uh, opportunity for people to understand that our money uh, has a problem. <laughs> our money causes problem through financial institutions. So, um, yeah, I think I think Japanese people are not really uh, care about money who, you know, um, who use banks or insurance companies um, and they don't care those money uh, where those money to be is used towards. So I think uh, those connection is necessary and uh, that is something that we could be uh, a part of the solution um, and be responsible about our money. <laughs> 
Yeah, I think it's just, it's not very obvious, right? That your money uh, in the bank is not just sitting in the bank, it's being used by the bank uh, to fund different projects so they can keep their bank going. It's part of um, their financial stability, right? Um, so if you choose banks where you put your money in, and the bank is making choices which are better for the environment, which are better for society, doesn't that make you feel better about where you put your money, where you're investing in, right? I think it's it's something a lot of people don't think about. It's a great way to attack this big problem, right? Yes. Um, the U.S. Uh, banks or European banks moved uh forward uh, faster than Japanese. And then when I spoke to one of the bank's people, um, they say that, uh, I, I asked them that why you still fund financing core and other. And they say that Japanese people don't ask us and then don't care. There's no you know, uh, people's voice, we cannot move. And yeah, so if we change um, our thinking and then we can change banks that's yeah the good yeah. you know yeah information. i hear that <laughs> i hear that all the time mm -hmm. uh from companies and i i try to make a suggestion how they could have less plastic packaging or stop using free grocery plastic bags which are still free in the supermarkets and they always say japanese people don't care about plastic pollution right so if you do care Please make sure and say you care because the companies have the impression that Japanese people don't care. And I'm not sure that's true. Right? Yeah, that's true. Uh, but I think this is the uh, very important um, things for us in Japanese. People don't uh, feel um, satisfaction of the Japanese government policy on climate and people care about climate impacts. As, a, as individuals, but people say nothing and be silent. Um, and because they, many in many cases, they, they feel that they can do uh, nothing, right? Uh, on this big issue, this is a politician's issues, this is big co company's issues. So I can, what I can do is to reduce uh, the, you, you know, um, the waste or at home on, on, on such a tiny thing that uh, that individual can do. But you know, being um, silent um, means that you will endorse the current situation, and then you will be a part of the problem. You continue to be part of a problem. So I think this is an important um, things for Japanese people to understand that we have a power, and we need to you know demonstrate our power to make changes. Without that. Uh, we cannot make changes. And my experience on fighting against coal power represent that even the number of the people who have brave to you know, speak out uh, about the issue on coal power, once people started to you know, uh, take actions, uh, tiny bits of it um, on, against coal, they will create the different uh, dy dynamics in the local communities and then they made it uh, stopping the project. So we shouldn't, you know, um, yeah, think that we have power S. Yeah, we shouldn't underestimate the mm -hmm. power of the people. Yes. The power of the consumer who can make better choices and change the market, change the way government works, right? Yeah. Yeah, wonderful. Um, another thing you talked about is in July, the House of Councillors election that 50% of the members are going to be reelected. Is there a chance in July that we'll see a shift in government policy for more climate awareness, you think? Well, uh, the election itself uh, is not the uh, timing for shifting the government policy. But uh, the um, commitment uh, from uh, the each party will be um, released. Uh, what to do if uh, the, those party is, you know, has a power 
in the government or each candidate's uh, commitment can be also uh, announced. So uh, how climate issue can be in, the, in their manifesto or in their uh, commitment, I think that's uh, the quite important thing. And because of the current war situation, energy issue and energy security issue will be uh, one of the uh, crucial uh, issue. So how uh, reduce, you know, shifting from dirty to cleaner energy can um, be as um, recognized in this is very important in terms of the climate. Yeah. Um, also, you talk about in August, the United Nations General Assembly, uh, there'll be a climate week in September, um, international collaboration uh, usually happens, but it's still going to be slow this year because of the COVID situation. Um, but that might in September, August, that might be another time we see Japan making statements about how they're going to align with international standards for climate change awareness or justice. What do you think? Yeah, uh, every year, yeah, at the end of uh, at, at the end of the year, there is a UN climate conference, uh, and this year COP twenty six will be held uh, in Egypt, and every year. UN General Assembly and Climate Week is a very important political moment to, you know, create political momentum to um, make COP meeting successful. So, how the head of state will announce what the what what the what are the messages from head of state uh, will announce is something to you know. Um, project the, the success of the COP26. And this is going to be a moment for uh, the Japanese government to announce what, how much, you know, how, you know, um, Japanese will prioritize this issue. So world, uh, world is watching uh, on the progress of the climate issue by the leader of the countries. Yeah, so uh, you said COP27, is in Egypt in November this year. So yeah, that'll be a really important time uh, for Japan's leader to make an announcement how Japan is changing its targets, hopefully updating its issue on using coal. Uh, in October, the World Economic Summit in Bali um, will also be held. Do you imagine Japan will have a, a statement or something at that time as well? Well, I don't know. Uh, actually, I am not sure not only when, but whether Japanese is ready to announce anything new <laughs> because they don't talk about climate that much. Actually, during this diet session, parliamentary session, uh, they do talk about the climate change, but actually they do postpone the one uh, legislation to increase the building uh, efficiency standards. This is so weird. Uh, the, the prime minister asked people to reduce uh, electricity consumptions and then increase energy efficiency, but the government is a, it, it, what government is doing is to postpone the energy efficiency law for building. So there are <laughs> contradictory actions by the government. So um, ideally, we expect the government to increase the emission reduction target by COP26 because the current government action is not sufficient. Uh, UN ask all countries to step up further uh, to fill the gap. Um, but um, I don't see that Japan is ready to uh, um, do that homework. Japan still argue that the current target is ambitious, so not too much to aim further. So we need more yeah. push. Let's 
<laughs> talk about the insulation standards and the building codes for a minute. Um, this is something that most people are really shocked at when they come to live in Japan and realizing how little insulation even new buildings have. And you talk about this in your newsletter that there are no standards for insulation. I heard years ago that there were going to be building standards, but maybe it wasn't passed. Uh, I have a walk in my neighborhood that I walk up and I look out on hundreds and hundreds of houses in my neighborhood. And I always count the number of solar panels on the top. And in the last 10 years, it really has not increased, even though a lot of new buildings were built. So wouldn't it be wonderful to have some kind of minimum standard for insulation, uh, encouraging solar on top of roofs? Why isn't this happening more in Japan? It's so frustrating. I know you you must have so much frustration for the, for the progress. Yeah, so Japanese house, uh, it's so cold in winter and it's so hot in summer. And Japan is the only de developed country which doesn't have uh, insulation standards uh, obligation in new building and new housing. So the uh, new uh, act uh, revision uh, of the current uh, building uh, uh, legislation is finally to introduce mandatory uh, standards for new building and new housing, all new building and new housing. Uh, so this is a minimum step for <laughs> the for us to, you know, um, the, to do uh, because new building, new house housing will be, you know, uh, there by 2050 or over 2050. So we have to have the highest standards uh, for the insulation. Uh, that's a must, I have to say, but still that um, revision of the legislation is postponed. I don't really understand uh, why. So this needs, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, is, it, is it connected to the way the housing industry makes money by getting people to buy new houses every 20 years instead of investing in higher quality houses that people can live in for longer, which are of higher quality, maybe? I am, I'm just guessing. But um, yeah, I hope to see those minimum standards pass. Yeah. That would be wonderful. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, uh, already housing manufacturers support this bill, uh, and there's no opposition. But quite strangely, uh, this is... Um, currently uh, decided to postpone, but I think there are a lot of movement uh, and action by uh, many actors and, and including the civil society to bring it back and then decide it uh, and adopt it, uh, pass it uh, at this diet session. There is still hope, uh, <laughs> so I don't uh, give up yet. Um, but the reasoning uh, to you know uh, be postponed is just because there's no time in, uh, during this diet session, and then they just they didn't prior, prioritize to pass the legislation at this um, diet session, because we the government see that well, what well, the, the diet see that they cannot extend the the period of the, the this session because election. There will be election in summer, so no time, not enough time to pass all legislation that the government submits. So they just decide this bill can be discussed later. So they oh please, <laughs> please prioritize this. Yes, this would make this would make a really positive impact. I think another thing that you talk about is the non-fossil fuel renewables and nuclear power is lumped together in a lot of and ammonia and hydrogen which is created from fossil fuel is also being included in the non-fossil fuel part of future legislation it doesn't seem very logic based 
Um, how frustrating. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, uh, there is another uh, set of uh, bills uh, that is combined at one. So it's so complicated that includes some good parts, uh, such as to um, support renewable energies and incentivize them. That is a good part. But at the same time, they, will, they include a nuclear power as well as uh, the ammonia and hydrogen that is produced from fossil fuels and to accelerate subsidizing them. So uh, it's hard for uh, uh, the diet member to, you know, um, block that bill because this is a mixture of the different uh, elements. Uh, but the intention is uh, to do everything. Uh, renewables a bit, but also support fossil related uh, technologies. So the what this bill means, I think this gives quite wrong signal to the market. You can do fossil business, you can continue doing that, but it also you can also build renewable energy such as solar and wind. So which one you should, you know, move towards? There's no, you know, signal to sh to shift, right? So I think uh, this is this is a lot of problem, and uh, if you know companies already engaged with the fossil business uh, may feel very relaxed because oh, this means means that we can continue fossil business and the government support that. So I think, um, yeah, how to shift this. Um, this direction is very, very uh, tough fight, but I think uh, the clear signal moving away from fossil, that's the way, is important. Uh, so we need to, you know, ask more that we do not need fossil related business or fossil new, new fossil technologies. One, one thing that I also find really frustrating, even from the last COP conference, was there seems to be a lot of emphasis on future technology that hasn't been developed yet mm -hmm. as the thing that's going to fix our problems in Japan mm -hmm. or around the world, right? Um, let's Why not focus on what we already see that's working? like wind energy, solar energy on top of homes, home batteries. We know this is working, but so much emphasis is on future solutions. Can you give some insight into that kind yeah. of problem? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the thing is, we have no time and we need change. So how we get change happen right now, right? And we don't see them. So um, we need to shift money, uh, where money to be used, right? Um, and we do not see the real change, uh, real economy changes. So that's the problem. So the basic problem is that Japan has been so successful in developing economy with technologies. And it's very difficult for them to think about something different. Too successful last few decades. <laughs> and uh, decisions making, in decision making process, the people who are in power are the representative from uh, the companies who had those success. So they want to protect their interests and they want to protect their business and they want to protect status quo and those people have power. <laughs> so it doesn't represent what we want and it, it doesn't represent the future um, pathway. So how do we flip that? Uh, I think I think this is a, this is a thing if we do you know um, not care about politics, if we do not care about the changes that needs to be happen right now, we just you know allow them to continue protecting themselves, very short term uh, profits for themselves. Can we accept that? <laughs> That's a question to us. It's hard. Um, it, it seems quite impossible for, for us to change them. 
uh, because so they are so powerful. Government is so powerful and a strong tie with industries uh, that consume a lot of uh, fossil fuels. But if you do not change it, we need to be part of the decision making. How we can do that? I think that's the thing that we need to think about it. Um, yeah, that's so important. And you seem to have a very interesting, again, uh, like many of these issues that you're trying to motivate change, uh, you have a legal approach. You have the grassroots uh, campaigners, uh, you know, pe petitioning approach. Um, you are also communicating with uh, education. You're a university visiting professor. Um, are you this year? Is that your target to have that multi-targeted approach again to these issues? Yeah, probably I do too too much uh, in terms of the approach, but I tested. Uh, I wanted to test that what is the you know effective approach in Japan. Well, sometimes that European approach uh, can be also used in this country, but I really want to you know try what is a good and uh, impactful approach in Japan. And so I wanted to continue uh, testing, uh, also uh, get good re result out of it. Uh, so I will do, uh, do uh, try and continue trying the different approach, but, but also not only by myself, but to get more people to be involved in this work and actions uh, so that I think, um, we will be able to change this country towards towards right safer direction. So I, I can always believe that change is possible. Wonderful. I would love for the last few minutes of the talk. I would love to know what you see as the ideal future for Japan in terms of clean energy or climate justice. If you could choose one, two, or three things that you think would be the best changes to happen in the next five, 10 years in Japan, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, uh, one thing uh, is that um, in, the, in the cabinet or in the, in the diet, more than half of the member, if needs to be women, female, so that the way to think the issue and the way to you know prioritize things and the way to choose technology will be very very different i think that's one <laughs> and secondly um we want to have very um stringent and powerful legislation by the government to be responsible for the action in the short term and mid term and long term to protect uh, uh, protect uh, the climate, our climate. And thirdly, we want to, I want to see local community very, very healthy and uh, active and where people lives with happy face because a renewable energy-based, cleaner energy-based society is uh, very independent uh, and very uh, decentralized uh, community that local community can produce energy by themselves and consume and economy will be uh, developed locally. So I think local government, local community can be flourished. Um, that's three my my three points. <laughs> I love it. Uh, three very important points. Uh, have fifty one percent of the government represent the population of Japan? Uh, women represented at least half in the government and decision making. That's a really important point. Um, powerful legislation moving forward for the 2030 and 2050 targets, not saying later, later, let's do it now, right? And then the third, the local communities, which are healthier and more self-sufficient in terms of energy. I would also add to that in terms of 
creating their own food, growing more local food, which mm -hmm. we know has a another big environmental impact, right? Yeah. Thank you so much. There's so many great ideas there. Wouldn't that be wonderful to see that happen this year? Uh, in 2020, this year, what one event are you really looking forward to and you hope Japan will have a positive announcement at which event this year? There are so many important ones. Well, I expect our prime minister uh, to announce very ambitious uh, target and vision at UN General Assembly in September. Yeah, let's look forward to that. That'll be wonderful. Uh, we had some comments from Allison on Facebook and Z on YouTube. Thanks for joining, guys. Uh, Allison says, yes, about growing your own food too. An excellent point about being decentralized and local. I love your vision. Thank you so much for joining. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. I would love to have you back in a future episode when our climate uh, justice and the different bills and mm -hmm. events and news is always changing so fast. It would be wonderful to have you back again, maybe in September after the big announcement. And we can talk about where Japan is and where it's going and progress, hopefully, by then. Yeah, I love to. <laughs> wonderful. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Take Thank care. Thank you.